So I was working on a video addressing the one of the common questions I get, which is, what do you use Plan 9 for? Um, and a video was posted today by Matt Brown about some recent talk about banning TP-Link devices in the US and about how one goes about you know, hacking into them. Uh, if you haven't seen Matt's channel, I would highly recommend it. And I'll have a link down below uh, to the video I'm talking about. But the short story is, is many of these sort of devices come with like identical and simple default passwords. Um, the other problem is, is that they will have um, sometimes uh, services running by default on the outside facing ports. So with that bit of knowledge, it's fairly easy to break into them from the outside. So back to me, what I use Plan 9 for. First off, Plan 9 is a research operating system. It was designed by engineers for engineers to do experiments on. And it was also designed in a time where networking with various heterogeneous systems was assumed to be the norm. So if you combine all that, it's, a, it's an environment uh, where you can easily experiment with networking equipment running Intel, ARM, or MIPS processors. So the first inspiration for me on what to do with Plan 9 was, you know, how do I handle all this like, you know, IoT stuff I find around me. And, you know, Plan 9 has some really great tools for dealing with that. Um, but, you know, one of the cool ideas was just how it handled networking various devices and how to handle permissions and all that. So the problem with existing sort of stuff now is, you know, you go buy yourself a router and it has some simple processor. This one's running like a, a MIPS processor on here, a MediaTek. It has some tiny bit of flash memory in it, a couple megabytes, um, and that's for cost reasons. And so to run these, you have to get Linux, you know, because that's the most common um, open source software people hack on. And you have to trim it down to fit on there. And, you know, Linux, like I've complained about before, was not really, you know, it's a clone of Unix, and Unix was not really designed in a world where you had lots of systems networked together to work as one unit. It was designed where you'd have these standalone time-sharing machines that might connect to other ones, um, but, you know, most people would just sort of log into it through some sort of serial terminal, originally an actual teletype, you know, typewriter. You'd get your, your, your console would print out on paper. Um, and so, you know, you have to, anything that has to do with like networking and all that's all added on afterwards. So this thing runs Linux inside of it. It's going to store its own passwords and it's going to come with some default ones from the factory. And when this thing has to check whether somebody accessing it is allowed to, this is the thing that decides it. No one else. So all the authentication is handled in here. Um, and if you want to access from the outside, there are some simple methods like secure shell and stuff. You know, in Matt's video, he points out that some of these are just straight running Telnet, which is, you know, very ancient, very insecure. It just sends everything as plain text. It's uh, terrible. No one should be using Telnet anymore. Um, but it's still out there because it's still a default thing on these machines. Um, so, you know, not everyone wants to use Secure Shell or Telnet in a console. So what's the next best thing? Well, you can add a web server so that you can have a web interface. You know, everyone has a web browser. There's, you know, one on your phone. There's one on your laptop at home. It's easy to connect to these things over the web. So you have to have a web server on here, which means you're going to have to cut out some other stuff to make sure that you fit a web server on here with web pages um, and all the stuff that it needs to do to pass around passwords and run authentication. Um, so, you know, you can complain about TP-Link and how they did stuff. Um, you know, I've broken into, you know, I've had videos where I've shown how I've broken into many of these. You know, this one here is a Linksys. You know, I'm not really, my concern is not getting remote access. You know, I'm trying to inject software onto it locally. So for me, I'm just mostly looking for UART pins. Um, which this one has. Um, all these things you can pry them open and, and get at the flash chips. But when I'm doing that, yeah, a lot of times I do have to look into, you know, what are default passwords to get into, say, U-Boot or anything like that. And they're pretty easy to find. Um, but yeah, so 
you know, how does something like Plan 9 solve this, these problems that you find on these sort of machines? Well, as I've demonstrated before, I can set these things up so that I don't use anything but U-boot on these things, just, you know, which is basically like the BIOS. Um, just enough to turn on and figure out where to pull down a kernel and what to boot. Um, after that, it'll attach to my nine front file server, pull down a kernel, start booting up. When it needs to authenticate with the network, it talks to my um, separate nine front authentication system. So what you'd have something like, you know, if I was to have my way or make a company that would do this, you know, you'd get something like one of these. This is pretty common now. This one I actually got out of a junk bin. It was for a, uh, a security system offered by Comcast. They're pretty common now. You find them for, you know, Google makes them, Amazon makes them. It's supposed to be a little command center. Um, has a touch screen on it. You get something like this. You can run a basic file and auth server off of this. You can have a way to, you know, a, a keyboard to type in your password. You could buy one of these devices and they don't have any operating system on it. Um, it comes with just enough brains to when you bring it home, it has to contact your server and then provision off of it. Um, and like I said, I've shown various other videos where you can use the various config systems and stuff to, you know, uh, send over a particular plan 9.ini for boot configuration, a specific kernel for a specific device based on MAC address. Um, and then, you know, you could have it either send over password credentials or do something else. Um, a lot of these now, this one's a, a really cheapy little Linksys, but a lot of them now come with like a USB on the back. You know, and I've shown how you could have the, what's called NVRAM, the, the password credentials on a thumb drive, plug it in, and now this thing will have credentials to boot off your um, local network. So how would that solve a lot of these problems? So again, a lot of these problems are because, you know, someone has to handcraft a very particular, you know, Linux distro that will fit in here with everything they assume you're gonna need. Um, and that's what you get from the store. And if you don't know how to set it up afterwards, um, that's how we get these sort of security vulnerabilities. They come from the factory with them. Um, you know, the common one about default passwords. Well, if you have something like, you know, uh, your own private file and auth server in your home, you know, while Plan 9 a lot of times uses Glinda as a default um, system administrator password, you don't need to. I've shown a few other examples of where I used, you know, something like the owner, you know, I picked my own name. Um, and so that, you know, that eliminates that default user of admin that's, that all these things use. Um, then you'd put in your own password. So again, now if someone's trying to access it from the outside, they have to both know what login is your actual system administrator, you know, what the name is, and, uh, and what the password is. And since Plan 9 doesn't use like, the traditional kind of user IDs, they can't just say, well, just give me user ID zero. You know, they have to know a name. Um, so yeah, that's one of them right there is you have the ability to not have these things come with a default root user and password that has full control over the device. You know, that would come from what you'd have in your house. So that eliminates that. The other one is, you know, these sort of default services thing. Um, again, these things have very limited flash memory, you know, for the storage, you know, but you could have some sort of device that has, you know, an NVMe drive or whatever, you know, sky's the limit as far as storage nowadays. Um, and I've shown how I booted up these devices, loaded anything I want to run off the file server, and I can just go hog wild until I've maxed out, you know, the memory in these things, the actual RAM. Um, so that means, you know, you're not limited to hey, these things shipped with a buggy version of the web server, and if you don't go in as the, as the root user in the device and have it pull down a fresh firmware, it's gonna stay buggy. Um, you could instead have it loading, you know, a, a web server if you still need one, off of your own local network that you could then keep up to date, you know, more easily since it's part of your, your home grid instead of its own standalone device that you have to log into separately with a separate login, a separate password, and use with its own totally unique interface. 
Um, so, you know, and I've also shown how you can have these things, you know, your, your file server um, have a, um, a boot up script, you know, a config, you know, the whole uh, slash CFG directory will contain various ways to tell these things, you know, any sort of device booting off the, uh, off the network, what to load, how to load it, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And so it becomes very easy for you locally to tell it, hey, you know, don't run stuff off the, you know, the WAN facing port. Um, and have, you know, basically, instead of these things coming with defaults, you'd have to, you know, have that in your home um, and that sort of thing. Um, and also just getting out access from the outside. If you're running a peer like nine protocol interface, um, that means that you have to, you know, talk to the device. You then have to go to a separate authorization server um, and check to make sure you're allowed to authorize this device. So inside your house, that'd be very simple. On the outside, you'd have to have an outside facing authorization server to do that. So you could tell this thing to boot up and then run an authorization server that comes back to where your passwords are stored. So you still potentially could have that if you wanted to, but it wouldn't be by default. You know, you'd basically tell this machine here, you're not an auth server, don't run authorization servers, especially on, you know, your WAN port. Um, so again, that would just solve that problem if you're mostly doing your communications over 9P. Uh, without an outside facing authorization server, there's just basically no way to get access to inside to this and then from in here to the rest of your internal network. So yeah, that's one of the things I do with Plan 9. And again, the reason is, is because Plan 9's, you know, it's a much smaller system. It's easier to read the source code to know what it's doing. If I want to modify it to do something else, that's very simple. I've shown things where it's like, I don't actually have to modify the source, the actual source code. I can make a file somewhere else, bind it over, you know, the kernel code and then compile it. Um, so that way I'm not actually modifying the base system. I can, you know, just apply my patches ad hoc, you know, just in a, in a specific window, you know, because of per process namespaces. And yeah, the whole thing, it, it assumes networking off the bat. That's why plan, you know, the nine protocol, people call it a networking protocol, but it's just a protocol that works well over a network, you know? So hopefully that was informative. Um, again, um, go check out Matt's channel, really good stuff on there. Um, you know, these sort of devices are all around us now. You know, I probably open this. Like this thing actually runs a, um, like a, an ARM, I think it's an M0. So it's like their microcontroller ARMs. So we've got ARM processors, MIPS processors. Um, this one ran, I think some sort of, I think it was a Qualcomm ARM processor. Never really got into it. Kind of, kind of gave up on it because like when I got it, I noticed like, oh, it takes um, SIM cards. So it has a, a modem in it. But when I cracked it open, found out it was 3G and 3G radios are being dismantled across the US right now. So it's kind of a, a pointless thing. But just have it, here's a demonstration of how these things are becoming increasingly common. And they're being used for just very simple stuff, but you could have it say be, you know, the, the authentication server in your house. You know, you could type in a password on the touch screen. You could build in a, a, a fingerprint reader. You know, this one comes with a little camera, facial recognition, whatever you want to do that you could authenticate that, hey, I'm allowed to attach, you know, new IoT devices into my house. And they don't have to c contact the outside world. Again, that's why these things have problems is they're expected to talk to the outside world, some cloud service. And that's just, that's just opening a hole. Um, if they're only expected to talk internally to some internal authentication server, that just takes that right out. Um, and then actually gaining control of them. Again, if you're not assuming some default root user named root or admin um, with a default password, um, all those sort of easy security holes go away too. Um, not to say that, you know, Plan 9 can't have other ones, but really when people are talking about this sort of stuff, it is the dumbest, easiest stuff. It is, you know, hey, I found a device that has a Telnet port open and it's user's admin and password's admin. Or in Matt's video, you know, he found out the password was 1234 and who knows how many devices just ship with that. Um, if you aren't 
letting the device them you know these devices themselves run their own authentication um that problem goes away if these things then have to contact some other authentication server that might actually you know not even be public publicly available um that security hole goes away so but anyway um hopefully that inspired some people here to maybe start looking into this and seeing you know kind of the fun you can have uh, developing other sort of uh, ways of doing networking. And as usual, uh, have fun.